Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Bikini in the Brain. I am here with the lovely Ashley Caldwell, sir. Looking extra high tech today. Shout out to high tech. Hey, shout out, shout out. <laughs> Best sponsors ever. Best high tech is a great sponsor. They're good yeah. to me. They are good. They are a good company. And, and they have great products. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really like high tech a lot. The owner's really nice. They run a great booth at the shows when they're when they're there. I like that. I like high tech a lot. So high tech likes you too. Do they? Good. Yes. I got I got they're they're great people. Yeah, that's that's one of the best companies I've seen in this industry, being in the industry as long as I have in terms of like taking care of athletes and like just doing the right thing. So, you know, usually something it's funny because you some a company in the industry long enough, usually something happens. Like nothing yeah. ever happens with high tech. They're just like straight arrows, man. Yeah. They just love it. Yeah. The great thing about high tech too, what people don't realize they own so many other brands. So it's actually high tech family of brands. So they have like eight brands in the family of brands. So high tech is the parent, I guess, company. And then there's other companies within it. So lots of variety there. I'll load up on my some some high tech protein. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, with uh our podcast today, we we started last week with QA one. We had mm -hmm. so many questions come in. We're Good doing question. a Q we're going Q and A two all the way through Q and A forty two. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're actually we're gonna match it to Ashley's wins by the end of the year. Q and A fifty. <laughs> we're gonna shoot for it. Tardigrade status. Tardigrade status. Is that what it when you hit fifty? It's yes, tardigrade. Yeah, tardigrade. that's right. Yes. I gotta remember. I gotta that upgrade word. to a tardigrade if I hit fifty. It go from a cockroach to a tardigrade. Which is even less more survivable than a cockroach. And right? cute way cuter too. Yeah. Let's not forget way cuter. <laughs> way cuter. Way cuter. Way cuter. So uh, we had a lot of good questions come in. If you guys are watching on the live on YouTube, um, feel free to ask your question there too. We got a couple good questions last week that we went into live. So might as well just jump right into it. We have a question from Joan and her question is, biggest change in training to achieve that insane muscle growth I'm pretty sure they're talking about you, Ashley. I don't know, man. They might be talking about you. <laughs> My Who arm knows struck. these days? <laughs> this one struck. I'm finally getting it back. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't think that my shoulder growth is insane. Like they say it, like, it's not like it just popped up overnight, you know? Um, it's actually years upon years in the making, like a decade in the making. Um, definitely my more stubborn body body part to grow. They don't grow quite as easily as the lower body. Um, but I will say I was consistent and persistent and over time accumulated that muscle. Now there was a time probably starting 2020 when my feedback started to become, we need more upper body because in bikini beforehand, it wasn't like a big deal. I didn't really have shoulders, uh, before then, I don't think. And it wasn't like a big deal. I never really heard that as part of my feedback, really. Um, but over time, I started to hear that more and more. Like, we need more shoulder. We need more upper body. So as the sport evolves, you can't have holes in your physique. So as I started to hear that more, I started to really focus my attention on the shoulders, give it an extra day of training, work with the stim machine, work with Sam. Um, but yeah, it wasn't anything in particular, I would say just dedicating more time to it. Well, there you go guys. Yeah. And that's, I think that's really it. You know, I think a lot of times people are in bikini might have unrealistic expectations on how long it'll take to get a pro level bikini physique these days. It's not going to be quick. It is not going to be quick. So, um, think about it in con. It's funny is that there is an old judge in Colorado, um, Dave Fuji, who's a, he's an awesome NPC judge. And he was, he was given this kind of pre-show speech. You know, they always like talk to the new people at the pre-show speech. He's like, it's, he's like, I love, it was like years ago though. He was like, I love bikini, you know, cause like, I'll talk to a bikini competitor. I'm like, how long have you been working out? And they'll be like, oh, six months, a year. You know, that was like 20, like probably 20, like 13, something like that. So like, then I'll talk to a, a bodybuilder and I'll be like, oh, how long have you, how long has it been since you've been working out and you're, you're doing your first show? And he'll be like, oh, it's been 15 years. <laughs> you know, like, like the difference used to be, you know, that's how it used to be. You'd get someone who was uh, a gymnast or something like that. And, um, or even just, you know, you get a lot of even like cheerleader type sp sporting where it wasn't like weightlifting sports, <clears throat> running sports, whatever. And they'd be on stage within four or six months. It wasn't, wasn't that crazy. You just had to have good legs, good, good tone. You weren't crazy shredded a little bit of muscle, but it wasn't anything past the normal sport person, right? Someone who played sports, but now it's a lot different. You know, the amount of muscle they have now is kind of similar to what they had in figure years back. So now as the sports evolved, you're looking at a, a physique to get to that pro level. A lot of you girls are looking at, you know, a five-year physique for some of you. So some of you, it's going to be three and maybe, maybe a little bit less. So just put, I think, time frame on it being, you know, realistic expectation. 
getting to the local level, yeah, you could probably do that in a year, year and a half, but we're talking pro level, um, three years, five years, that's kind of like the standard. And and to be a good pro, it's like probably like closer to that five year marker. Ashley's got a lot of, of uh, training years under her, under her belt because she did sports and stuff her whole life too. Mm -hmm. So that's another advantage to get that kind of muscle density, you know, that's going to come with time and years of, of weights. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So be patient, ladies, be patient. Cause this sport is going to take a while. Take a, take a note from the body, but didn't get on stage for 15 years, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. This is funny. Cause it's two Ashley questions in a row. I'm so sorry, but You're this fine. one is important and the public <laughs> needs to know. <laughs> so you got whoever sent this one has been lifting or lifting. Well, of course they've been lifting. I think they're flexing in their profile picture Those but <laughs> <laughs> they've been listening to this podcast because they know that's my thing starburst packets the gallon the big gallon packs you can get them at walmart dumping in your gallon tastes so good i add salt with it and i add extra sweetener so good versus my wrigley's five either spearmint or cobalt blue that's my ish i would say if i had to give up one i would actually say the starburst packets i would give up because really? gum Two really? packs a day of gum. Sorry. I'm sorry. Two I'm, packs of gum a day. I thought Keeping you were. Keeping these teeth nice and clean, though. I thought you were going to go the other way with that no. one. Because I can't. I hate. It's so weird. I don't like regular water that much. Unless I'm like. I know. I don't like it that much. Even. Like, unless I'm. Like, if I'm like 30 minutes in boxing or something and I have to drink regular water. But I'll still drink like a sugar-free Gatorade 2 or put Mio in my water. So I thought for sure. Because how sweet you like things that you would go the other way. Well gum sweet too but yeah i i'm i always that's drink funny. my water with flavoring it does help you get the water and that's mm -hmm. for sure i can easily drink two gallons with a pink starburst a gallon drink packets with salt and extra sweetener i can drink like i have to like sometimes i have to refrain from drinking it because i know once i start i'm gonna keep drinking till i feel sick like i'm like i love it it's <laughs> so good yeah you're actually one that might drink too much water sometimes yeah just it's just uncomfortable and then i pee all day <laughs> All day. She's a three gallon or sometimes and she's 125 ish pounds, you know? That's, yeah, that's been a thing before. Not an everyday yeah. thing, but it's been, I've, I've done that. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's a, going, traveling with bikini girls is difficult with, uh, cause you need to always make sure there's going to be a bathroom soon. Kimber was the same thing on the, like, we drove to, <laughs> to California. I was like, okay, we needed like three breaks, like <laughs> one hour breaks to get through, you know, on, on the water. Uh, all right. So, you know, what's your, we should ask the, uh, for the audience, your favorite, water flavoring is it the jolly rancher one your favorite water flavoring that's the absolute favorite no my favorite is the starburst pink we've only been talking about oh, it for the past 10 minutes. Oh, i'm sorry i'm looking at the jolly rancher that's what it is she <laughs> I was like, me, are you listening no, wait, to me she gave me she gave me this and i'm looking at it because I, I looked at it right now i was going to bring it over to the frame if it was the starburst oh. one but it's that one you gave me that's for blue blue for <laughs> what for my birthday or something like that at Christmas. So uh, I, was, I was looking, I was like, oh, do I have it to show everyone? But then that's funny. Is that the favorite one though? That's the absolute Starburst favorite. Starburst pink, yes. Starburst pink, absolute favorite. Okay, With mine. So extra salt and extra sweetener in a gallon. Okay, mine is Mio tea, the Mio iced tea flavor. So boring. <laughs> so um, speaking of flavoring foods and things, this person wants to know about prep food. Is chicken seasoned any oil or 100% plain? Ooh. God bless this person. Yeah. Thinking we're eating some boiled chicken plain. 1990 with, style. <laughs> we're they boiled that? chicken. No, no, no pepper, no nothing, no salt, just plain. Oh, man. Which is, oh my gosh. I can guarantee you, if it weren't for seasonings and condiments, I would not be able to prep as long as I, get, as I do. God bless this person thinking I'm doing this for 10 years of boiled chicken plain. Yes. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> like there's this idea that we're way more hardcore than we are. And maybe at some point bodybuilders were that way, but it, it we're not like that anymore. You know what I mean? Especially bikini. Like it's a little, little less rigid as than you think I would say. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. So that's yeah back in the day they did do that it's funny it's like almost it was almost like who could go more hardcore yeah. more you'd see a lot of bodybuilders doing that just boiled chicken breast and like white rice or actually brown rice that was like the meal and i was like man that's that's crazy hardcore you know but now i mean we and ashley would spend we have fun trips to penzi spices and different spice stores and like just try different spices and then all these sugar-free things and yeah you don't have to worry about that stuff um 
you know, maybe when you're in peak week, the last few days before the show, I try to avoid adding too many different things just because you just never know if you're sensitive to something. I've seen, I've had, I've done a lot of like food allergy tests with people and I had, it was really funny. I had a pro a long time ago named Kelly and she loved cinnamon and she loved, it was something else. It was cinnamon and something in this, in this powder, right? Uh, oh, coffee. It was coffee. She liked cinnamon and she liked coffee. And then um, it was like peak week. She's like, oh, I'm so happy I found this, this cinnamon, whatever coffee flavoring for peak week. Cause like, I don't know how I was going to get through peak week. And then her, her actually food sensitivity test came back the same day. Cause we're going to cut all the different foods for peak week just to try to bring her waistline in tighter. And then the two of them that popped up were coffee and cinnamon. It was like, it was like an hour later and she's like, well, that's less, less and quick. And I was like, I am so sorry. I didn't even know someone could be sensitive to cinnamon and coffee like i didn't even know that was a thing right and it was a bit apparently you know a lot of times what happens with food sensitivities is like the more you have them it seems like the more sensitive you kind of get on these on these tests and when you're getting ready for you know pro shows you you kind of look at whatever you might be sensitive to and you just you take all these extra precautions probably wouldn't change your physique much at all like noticeably but it's just one of those things in peak week you're like okay let's just eliminate any possibility of all these crazy things i've seen sensitivity to onion and um, certain types of peppers. Like I've seen all these weird sensitivities. So uh, chili powder was what it was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so um, yeah, there you go. So yeah, but the rest of the time, eat whatever, eat whatever, it's fine. As long as it's not adding a bunch of calories, go for it. Mm -hmm. Next, we have a nice sciencey question for Adam here. How important is the breakdown of protein in daily meals to avoid catabolism? Well, it is important, but it's not as important as you're probably thinking. So Protein itself is, you got to understand, it's not going to be, it's not a desirable thing for the body to break down muscle like we think it is. I think, I think a lot of times bodybuilders think there's like, like if you looked at a cup and you filled it with water, that if you're not filling it constantly with a couple drops of water, that cup's just going to spill out. You're going to lose all your protein and lose all your gains. Like that's not how muscle building works. That's not how, how it works. You can, you, you know, your, your body's going to, yeah. Um, take a little bit of amino acids out of the out of the muscle, but the most time it doesn't really. It's not desiring to lose muscle. The only time it's really desiring to lose muscle is if you're in these like big deficits. You're maybe not creating any stimulus to keep the muscle, and it's your body's burning so much energy unnecessarily that because you have extra muscle that you're not using, that it's going to break it down because it's going to seem like it's unnecessary. You know that type of thing. So it's not. It's a little bit harder than people think to lose muscle. Some of you are out there and you're kind of going a little crazy eating protein every two hours. And like when the timer goes down to two hours, you're like, I got to I got to eat something or else I'm going to start losing my gains. Like it's it really isn't that way. There's been a lot of a lot of research on this. You can look it up. There's tons of research on it on, you know, how muscle breaks down and how long it's going to take to break down and how um, how many meals you can eat. There was studies. There was one that showed um, the differences of like even at, at this is like a fat loss more so, but it was how much fat you would lose at eating at different meals throughout the day. And there was one, it was like 14 meals, six meals and three meals. And the difference of fat loss was all like identical between the three. It was like actually slightly better on the three. And then they took it one step further and went two, four and six. And then it was actually very, very slightly better on the two, but it was pretty much identical. And it showed in that too, that the muscle wasting in between them was very similar too. It was like almost none. So it's like, it's, it's not what people think it is. Just make sure you're getting in the amount of protein you need per day and that could be split up, you know, two meals, three meals. I I try to stick to at least three meals in a post workout is what my minimum kind of is for my clients. So I'll say, you know, do a three meal and then your post workout. And if you do that, you should be fine. Um, if you have to go less than that, maybe you're a nurse and you can only do, you know, your morning and then you work a 12 hour shift, then you do your workout, post workout, and one more meal. That's fine too. You should be fine with that. Um, but there's a lot of more re like recent research studies on protein. We used to think, oh, you can only take in so much protein at a time. Like you'd only take in let's say 30 grams of protein at one time. So you need to just space them out, but it's actually showing like the more space you have in between meals, the more you can take in at one time kind of thing. So yeah, maybe you could only do one meal a day, but you do 150 grams of protein. And maybe that's the same as eating 150 grams of protein split throughout the day in terms of muscle wasting. It's probably similar. I don't know that I'm just throwing that one on top of my head. Um, but from what I've seen, it seems like that would be logically be closest to the same based on what the research is coming out as. So I wouldn't worry too much about it eat when it's comfortable for you to eat, eat when, you know, you're, you're kind of used to eating, um, and don't stress yourself out. So yeah, there you go. Ashley combines meals sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I tell athletes, Hey, if you're, if you're set up on six meals per day and you're out 
on a, you know, a hike or you're with your family at some event, or you want to eat a bigger meal with your family, combine two meals, combine three of them. It's not going to hurt you. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we have any good questions oh, yeah. in our, in our, uh, YouTube here. Getting some questions and thank you guys so much for the, the questions. Um, oh, this is a, uh, let me see here. Let's see here. Here's a question that came in. <laughs> Let me get Ashley question. Mm -hmm. Kayla, thank you for your question. Any tips for getting off tan faster between shows? I like to use Liquid Sunray's product called Erase It. So they make a special product to get the tan off. Um, but just scrubbing every day is going to help that as well. So getting the tan off, um, you know, I'm I'm thinking it's probably we want it just to come off more um, evenly, right? Because the tan's going to fade the more you shower, obviously. But to make sure it comes off evenly and not all splotchy and gross, definitely scrub every day. Use your Erase It product and you should be good to go. There yeah. you go. And moisturize, of course. So here is a, a good question because this one's kind of controversial. Alexander Armstead asks, why do you need to cut artificial sweeteners or stevia during peak week? And, and I, I don't. Yeah, I will say this. That has. <laughs> well, I, I let me backtrack. I don't I, I do stevia on peak week, but I won't do anything like sugar, alcohol. That's mm -hmm. going to cause me gas or bloating for that reason. There you go. So stevia to me is OK. It's one of those things you better be careful and try, give it a test run to know that your body isn't going to react weird to it if you do stevia. Some people I've never met someone that was yeah. had problems with stevia. Yeah. So I've over the years, I've kind of changed this a little bit myself because I come from, you know, a hardcore bodybuilding background in Southern California. You got to remember that's like my upbringing, working in supplement stores and then, you know, gyms or, you know, it's different in, in Southern California back then is very hardcore. You know, everyone was like the more hardcore you could be wasn't like it was like almost like wasn't enough. Like, the more <laughs> the more hardcore, the more hardcore. And we're talking, you know, the mecca of bodybuilding and I grew up in. So the um, so, yeah, that was one thing we're like, oh, you don't need stevia. You don't need sweeteners. You don't need any of this. And if you do, you're weak, right? It's like you, you just toughen up. Don't do it for the whole month before the show, right? You need because it's going to make you hold water, right? And so for years, I just goes like, eh, it's just a week. Get over it. You'll be fine, right? I just tell everyone, yeah, you'll be fine. It's fine. It's like four days during peak week. Like, how is, is it really hurting you? And so um, that was kind of my logic. And most people were like, yeah, that's that's fine. And I don't really care that much, you know? So, but then we kind of, as the years have gone on, um, especially with bikini competitors being more active and, and a lot of them nowadays are being a little bit more active. It's, it's definitely, it takes a, a lot out of their life to like switch things up. They like an energy drink, they like uh, whatever. And if they're not, if they're not bloating from it any other time, why would they during peak week kind of thing? So it's kind of been a little bit more lenient on those things, but I will say on sugar alcohols, definitely any of those mm -hmm. things, I would say still eliminate them. But the reason that people cut them is because it potentially will make you hold water the 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 logic of there out there is that your body doesn't know what to do with it so it attaches water to it to try to drive it out of the system that's the the logic of it of why people avoid it because it's a it's a it's a foreign thing to the body and the body's like i don't know what to do with this i'm just going to attach water to it i see it as a toxin and i'm going to attach water to it and, and, and it's going to i'm going to pee it out of the system so the the theory is okay if i have more of that in my system i'm gonna have more water held up in my system um but who knows how long that process is who knows if that's even a thing that's just what i was kind of that's kind of the bodybuilder did they get it right? <laughs> Bro science type of thing. I don't know. So I've always been kind of one of those things, but, um, but Kimber was having her energy drinks last weekend before the show, last week before the show, um, you know, all the way like right before the show. So, um, you know, is I like to eliminate possibilities, but if you've done it 10 times and you know, you, you see yourself not getting bloated and you see yourself not holding water and, and you look, um, good enough, then what does it matter? So if that's a lot of times too, with like supplements, we'll cut a lot of different supplements out. If you're, if you look good and you're on all those supplements, then why change it? You know, if you're, if you look good enough at that point, sometimes coaches will overcorrect and then it starts making things worse. So it really comes down to how you're looking that last week too. If we're trying to, if you're behind, I'm trying to correct, dot all my T's and cross or dot my I's and cross all my T's. And I'm like, maybe this could be it. Like that would probably be more likely, but if you look good, just keep doing what you're doing, you know, we'll go through and load some carbs and we'll be, we'll be good to go. Yes. But I definitely want to stress that it has to be a sweetener that you're already familiar with mm -hmm. uh, because even like trying a new protein bar or something that has like a weird sweetener that you're not used to, you can tell like 
do you ever eat something or, or drink something that has like a sweetener in it? And you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm bloated. And I got tummy bubbles and everything. Then definitely stay away from that. I just keep it to stevia only on peak week. Usually, uh, just, just to be sure. Uh, but I, I would also say too, when we say stick with stevia or any sweetener, if you're doing it, like putting it on your food or putting it in your coffee or whatever, make sure it's like the pure stevia, which you can get on Amazon. It's like really expensive for like a pound, but it lasts forever because it's pure because what you see in those packets, like those green stevia packets, the main ingredient is multidextrin, a carb. So just make sure you're getting the pure version or the liquid. Liquid's fine too. Yeah. And I've even seen, we actually saw it last year. I think you pointed it out where we saw bodybuilders oh, with yeah. flavored waters oh, yeah. before the yeah. Olympia. Yeah. They had a gallon of Maybe it could, it could even be Starburst Pink. We don't know. <laughs> it could have been. Maybe they're on to it. They but listen. They yeah, listen. so they'll, they'll be drinking the day before. And I'm like, okay, well, if there's anybody that needs to be careful of water retention, it's the bodybuilders, and they're doing it. This so. is Olympia, at Olympia. the Olympia. Olympia. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's it seems like the overly cautious is kind of being over um, – people are seeing it now, you know, they're, yeah. they're like, okay, what's the common sense? Is it really doing anything? I think that's being asked more now. And before it wasn't, it was just like hardcore, just hardcore, <laughs> just water, brown rice, to a boiled chicken breast, tilapia the last month. That's it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And also be careful if it's carbonated, like on show day, don't do carbonation on show day. That's going to obviously cause some extra air in your tummy, which we don't want. So, yeah. So we have another question that came in on the live, which is a pretty mm -hmm. good one um, about this is more technical, but still pretty good. Um, it, Laura Bevis asks, I want to know about why and when to use carb or fat loading, please. It is more about digestion or aesthetic decision. She said, please. OK, well, if you said, please, you Just know, because you I said actually please. wasn't going to answer this. She <laughs> <laughs> said, please. Uh, so the fat loading thing, it's not so when people say fat loading, um, I think they, they don't understand what, how it works. And, uh, I mean, I guess you could still fat load, but without it actually like loading in a muscle cell, but people don't understand like what's going on during peak week. They're like, Oh, I'm going to load with fats. I'm going to load. And that's not really what's happening. You're not going to load fat into the muscle cell and make you round and full. It's not like it's going to work that way. So, um, your, your body's going to store uh, glycogen in the muscle cell with water. And that's, what's going to make you really round and full and looking round and bubbly. So that's, that's going to be the car. That's going to be what you're loading with. That's going to be the only thing that really makes you round and bubbly and full. So what are, why do we add fats then? And why is it necessary? Well, there's certain times where let's say someone just turns on fire, you know, and they just like start burning through carbs and they're burning through them during peak week. And um, let's say, for example, let's say all of a sudden Ashley started burning through carbs, right? It hasn't happened, but let's say she goes in, she needs 400 carbs on Thursday. And I'm like, man, you're still not catching up. If I give her 500, 600 carbs to have her catch up, her waistline is going to be just so distended eating that much food. And we're talking 100 grams of carbs, six meals. I mean, that's a lot of volume of food. Unlikely we're going to get her waistline to be that classic Ashley waistline, right? So what do I do to do that? Well, I'm going to give her some fats. It's very low volume um, in terms of the, the, of the size of it, right? Especially if we add in the oils to fats like in, um, in rice and whatnot. And what's going to happen is I can still keep her at only 400 carbs or maybe even lower it to 300 carbs and her body will have that fat to use as energy and it'll use that as energy versus burning through the carbs as energy. And it'll hopefully, in theory, hopefully use that fat as the primary source of energy because it's easier for the body to do that. And then um, what it's going to happen is those carbs are going to be reserved to be stored in the muscle and stored in the muscle cells. So we're trying to give your body a source to get through and store the carbs the best way. Um, the best way possible. So um, it's not a loading thing. You're not loading fats into your, you know, into your muscle cells. It's just a preventative thing and to keep the volume down lower. And some of these, some of, especially some of these bikini athletes, you know, you remember you got to get them. Sometimes they're like at 1,100 calories. If all of a sudden they turn on fire, they're not even capable of eating 3,000 calories worth of carbs. Like it's just, it's just too much. You don't want them feeling sick and being so far out of their norm before the show. So that's, that's the reasoning for it. It's more so of just a calorie thing. Mm -hmm. Any more Let's questions? go back to our usual questions now, and you guys can continue to ask those and we'll track back on those frequently. Okay. What's the difference between NPC and IFBB posing routine? 
the length, the time, and the walk back. A lot of IFBB competitors walk to the back, and there really isn't time limits for the pros, usually, unless it's something like the Arnold or the Olympia, there's a time limit, but you'll see pro routines are usually about a minute. Uh, is that is that a fair statement? Yeah. A minute? And yeah. then NPC, sometimes they'll cut you guys off at 20 or 30 seconds. Yeah. It depends on some of these shows are really fast. Yeah. Like if it's a big show, I've I've never seen it happen where they actually stuck to it, but I've seen them say 15 seconds. And I'm like, that's really quick. Yeah. But it, you know, you gotta remember that's when shows were really, really big. And then I just don't I see them tell them that. Maybe they don't maybe they don't really like think about the time, but it's like the expert say, hey, you got 15 seconds. Um so just be prepared if you get to these really big shows, maybe a national show or just a big a show turns up where it's a one day show and it's a thousand people total entered, like you're probably gonna have to go a little bit faster. But I'd say, yeah, for the most part, you got it. You got it right. 2030 um, is pretty, pretty realistic. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, you could get asked to just hit your front pose, back pose and walk off. Um, that is, it is the, just so just be prepared for that. It could happen. Absolutely. Okay. So next question comes in and yeah, I'll, I'll dive into this question. Dive it in. <laughs> because I think it's important. It says, are, yes. are implants really necessary to do well in the sport? Oh, no. yeah. No, 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 no. So you can fake it easily with pillow stuffing mm -hmm. and it's called polyfill. You can get it at the craft store, uh, but you can put pads in your bikini top, obviously. And if the pads are still not enough projection, just use polyfill. I, I used to do that too. So you know, there's ways around it. And I would say sometimes if you get too big of implants, they can actually hurt. Yeah. And it's hard for the, that to be your actual feedback to be like your chest is too big, but you can see it as like a spectator, someone that looks really off balance, like, cause they're so top heavy that like everything else looks small. So you don't want to be too top heavy. And I would also say too, um, a lot of girls get implants when they're lean, but then when they become a normal person, body fat percentage, it's like way too much. It is way too much because they're used, they're, they're seeing themselves stage lean, but you're not always going to be stage lean. And where do women usually put on fat? It's usually there. And it's also glutes, right? Or thighs, but yeah, you don't need, you don't need, there's ways around it. And they're not really looking at your boobs, honestly, but they are looking at your shape, like your shape. I get you want to be symmetrical. So just use polyfill. Yeah. So. And that's something that actually, well, I was in a seminar recently and Sandy even addressed it because someone asked that question too. And she said, I've never once judged anyone differently for having implants or not having implants. She's like, so it was like, she was very clear about that. She's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. So, um, so there you go. And that's from, you know, Obviously, it's someone who judges the most out of out of all the judges. So, yeah. So there you go. All right. Um, oh, well, this is a hard question. Yeah, this is it. I've a had this conversation. One. I've had this conversation. Um, at what point do you tell an athlete that competing may not be for them? That's a that's a tough tough question. Do you want me to jump into that one? Should I take it? Jump yeah. Right in. All right. So, um, I would say at the point where they've lost the fun of it. They've lost the passion of it. And it becomes more of a task than it was a, like a fun journey for them where when it becomes like something they're, they're hating to do it. And they're just like going through the motions because they kind of feel like they have to, because they committed, I will tell them, Hey, you know what? Take some time off and, and find the joy in this again, because it should be something that it should never be like a job. It's always going to be hard, but it shouldn't be like, Oh, I got to do another show. I got to, I can't believe I got to eat this chicken and all these things, you know, it should be like a, a, a privilege and a, a fun thing and your daily task. And yeah, it's going to be hard. You're gonna have times where you want to maybe where it's, it's too hard. You might want to quit here and there, but when you're just like in that, where you're not giving your best, um, you really have to look at, okay, do I just need time off? Because I'm not, I'm not going to give my best. And I've had to have this conversation with, with regular athletes, even pro athletes. And I'm like, Hey, like it's too tough. Like it's not, this is not a sport where you can kind of do it. You know, you can't play competing, you know, it's not like, Oh, I'm just going to go and I'm going to play some basketball. I'm, I'm not my best today. I'm just going to play some basketball. I'll just pass a little more or whatever. You can't play competing. <laughs> what you don't do every day will show on stage. You can't play it. So um, it's, it's, it's one of those things. You either give it your all or you, you know, take some, take some time off or find a way to give it your all, you know, cause it won't work at that, especially at the highest levels. If you're not giving a hundred percent, like absolutely hundred percent, someone's going to pass you. You're going to slip in the ranks. You're not going to be your best because everyone else is up there. They're giving their hundred percent. So how do you expect your genetics are not that good? I don't care who you are. You can be the best genetics in the world. 
you're still genetics aren't going to be good enough to have to beat someone with also really good genetics, maybe close to as good of genetics as you who's working 100 percent. That's the problem is as you as you, you can get away with it at like an NPC level here and there and you're like, oh, my genetics will carry me through my shape. Cool. But as you work up, you work up to better genetics and better genetics and you get to the highest level. It's like everyone has good genetics and then you're trying to slack off there. It's not going to work because everyone with the just as good of genetics is working 100 percent. So just understand that's if you're taking on this venture and you want to go to that level, it is going to take you going 100 percent um, to be good. Doesn't mean you can't have times in between where you take some time off and you're enjoying you know, you're having some some balance in life, but it does mean your balance in life is still fitness focused. It's not like you just don't work out and you gain 40 pounds. It's like I'm still a competitor. I still need to be fitness based. I can be a little looser. But, um, you know, if you can't do that, that's kind of when I'm going to have those conversations and be like, hey, you're uh, you're is, are you sure you still love this? <laughs> like, are you sure this is for you? Do you need some time off? What's going on? So that's if you're asking that's a, a good question, because you're asking yourself that you got to ask, ask yourself, what's my why? Um, do I really want to do this and why do I want to do this? And if you're having a hard time staying motivated, maybe now's the time for you to take a little break because you're, you're not going to get the outcome you want with a, with a 90%, um, like a 90% effort. This is something I want you to remember. You can't play competing, not, not a sport like that. Um, you know, if I, I could play hockey growing up, I have a little injury, no problem. I'm just not going to go into the net as hard. I'm going to pass a little more to my friend. I can, I can, I can get away with 90%, you know, but not here. It just doesn't work. So. Absolutely. Okay. Any, you want anything on that? You should, you have any, no, I, th I was just about to say the same thing. And then also of course, health issues. Uh, if this sport is affecting your health negatively in any way, mm, cause yeah. some people do have health issues, then I would say it's probably not for you. You know, we don't, the goal here with competing isn't to become unhealthier at the end of it. It's, you know, to maintain your health at least, but yeah, some people have conditions and just can't work around it. Yeah, fighting that. I do see that. That one does suck. I've seen that too. And someone wants it really, really bad and their body just doesn't do it for them. You know, yeah. and you're just like, you know. Or some, even some eating disorders, I'd say this is, it's probably not the best you need to find. Because some people seek the sport to correct their eating disorder because they have um, a schedule, some, you know, they have a, um, not a schedule, it's. A plan basically yeah they feel like that might help them but sometimes you know send those people to somebody that can help therapy wise first i would also say you know we don't we're not here to fix eating disorders it's probably not the best mindset to have coming right in there's a step in between that you need to fix mentally first before you think about competing yeah that's an important one too especially yes yeah. yeah, it, and it's um you know i have found that the sport I think that this sport it can it, help. Yeah, it can help. Um, but they they need a bridge in between. Yeah, you need to get be corrected Fix first. But your mental first before you come. I've seen um, the, the some of the times where it helps the most is when someone's eating too little. Yeah. I do see oh, that yeah, that yeah. this sport helping like that's an easier segue to get in than than rebounding and eating too much and kind of going through that. That mm -hmm. this sport I don't think helps that much with that at all. But the eating less sometimes it can help um, because you have to. That, I've, I've had a couple of clients that had um, like eating disorders where they're eating too little. They went through the, the, the psychological part of it first though too. And then they went into the sport and then they were like, yeah, this helps me because I'm able to eat. I have to eat more in order to have muscle. Mm -hmm. So that was the one, some of the ones where it would, it would be helpful. But the, the other end of it where they're having like binging and stuff almost all the time, if they didn't do anything on the mental side after the show, it just went really bad, you know? And so, yeah, that's something that I think is a good point to bring up too. Cause that is, uh, if you're having binging, if you're, you know, doing that binge disorder, um, <clears throat> post show is going to be pretty difficult for you when your plan is not there. And if you're, and I think another thing too, is people need to recognize when they have that, you know, if you're someone who is, you know, rapidly gaining weight, like in your after shows and you're going, you know, with these people, we talk about 30, 40, 50 pounds <clears throat> post show and it's repeating, repeating, you might want to like ask yourself and like talk to someone and be like, Hey, do I, maybe do I, do I actually have an issue with this? Like, is that something I need to at least look at? And I think that it, if it's going that high, it's something you might want to at least like inquire about and, and, and see if you can get that taken care of, you know, like worked on. So there you go. All right. So good, good points on that, Ashley. Um, <clears throat> Fit by Ken's, how to tell if you are muscular enough to be a competitor as a first time competitor? It's another hard question to ask. It is. I would say having a coach, 
that knows what they're looking at is a, uh, a plus, but everyone's going to be a little different, right? Yeah. Um, I would say having at least a little bit of a cap on your shoulder, some sort of definition, your midsection, uh, even a slight bit of tie-in at, at least, at the very, very least. Um, but there is no telltale like, oh yeah, you're for sure muscular enough now until you stand next to others that are about to compete as well or have a coach that can look at you and let you know, hey, we're we're good. We're ready. Yeah. Mm, I, and then if you're really questioning it, there's posing seminars pretty much in every state nowadays. So go to a posing seminar, um, pose with a group of people. You know, if you feel like you're, you could, you can get in your bikini and, and pose next to people and you'll see people who are competing. Usually when there's a posing seminar, you'll have, you know, five of the people there competing in the next like month. You could look at yourself next to them and kind of like, okay, do I line up with them or am I way smaller? And if there's a, a coach there that's, you know, reputable, then you can ask them, how far am I away from competing? They'll be happy to answer that and give you some more clarity too. But I think that those are all good, good cues as well. And, um, but yeah, if you need to know for sure, go to a posing seminar and you should be going to posing seminars anyway. You know, you should be going to posing workshops and, and getting your practice in anyway. So mm. cool. Cool. So you have a, this is pretty funny. Um, so looking at a couple of the, uh, other, of these lives still guys, but, um, we're going to go into the next question. Um, are there co any common mistakes first time competitors make on stage? Fit by Ken's again, asking some fire questions. Yeah, thanks, Fit by Ken's. <laughs> yeah, so if we're thinking of like on stage, I think is a little different question than just in general, like competing uh, mistakes, if that makes sense. So if we're thinking of just on stage, I would say competitors will not look very confident, I guess. Uh, a little shaky, a little nervous, which is sometimes not a bad thing. It's okay to be a little nervous. That means you care, but not having the nerves under control. And it's one of those things. It's hard to say, "Hey, stop being nervous." Yeah, it's not. It's not that easy. So it's something that just happens over time. I also find that a lot of times the competitors take too long on stage um, because they're adding in all these these posing transitions that they saw someone do. That's a mistake I see where you just keep it simple and. That way it's more fluid and you don't have as much to think about. But I would say like if we're looking at competing in general for first time competitors, I would say focusing too much on placing is the biggest one. So in your first show, everyone, listen, everyone wants to win. Okay. We're all there to win. We would all love to win, but only one person's going to win. So I think especially in your first show, give yourself a little grace and don't focus so much on the placing. Okay. Because like, because guess what? You're going to make mistakes. It's your first show. You're going to look back and probably laugh at it and be like, why did I do that? That's silly. I know I did. I think we all did. We all look at our first show and be like, why? What? I made, I made 10 mistakes. You're yeah. going to make mistakes. No one's going to just enter their first show perfectly. Everything. Because even as a pro now, I don't have like perfect shows. There'll always be something I can do a little different, a little small mistake here and there. But you're going to have a lot of those as you're first getting started. And I think sometimes, you know, you feel the energy. You feel like, yeah, I want to win. I want to win. I want to win. And then, you know, you enter the show, you compete and you realize maybe you don't fall where you thought you would. You didn't win. <laughs> that can oftentimes be very discouraging. Okay. So that doesn't, just because you lost that show doesn't mean you're going to lose the others. And then the others, you kind of have to build up, right? And you have to get better. You have to learn from your mistakes. So I would say, if you're focusing on just winning, you're taking the fun out of it on your first show um, because it's going to be difficult to do. And maybe you will win. Maybe you're a true novice that wins the overall to show. Then you've just beat the odds. Congratulations. you That's icing on the cake. And I think we should all try to win and aspire to win. But just realize, especially in the beginning, it might take a few shows to find your rhythm, to find what works, to correct your mistakes, to learn from your mistakes. You know? Yeah. I think that's great. The, I will say too, just a couple of the other um, little things is just make sure that you are on time. On time, yes. absolutely. We have that all that story of the last few few podcasts of the story of being on time, and then um, but your your suit selection. You know, do your research on the suit selection. 
try not to do anything extra. You know, don't be so matchy matchy on your makeup. Like, you know, if you have a, a bright green suit, you don't need bright green eyeshadow. You know, you don't need green nails, green eyeshadow, green gems in your shoes. <laughs> like it is, you don't need all that. I'll say that's a common thing at the beginning. Um, trying to trying to reinvent the wheel, I say is another common thing. Beginning of like, oh, I'm gonna go with, you know, a, a different like a, a multicolored suit or something like that. And, you know, just go with what works. You know, I say just stick to look at look at how the top ten look. Um, that's always gonna be kind of your your guideline and marker. And if you go with what they're doing, you're gonna usually be safe in terms of your your hair, your suit, your your shoes, your jewelry selection. Try not to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know it. it there's a reason that the top 10 look the way they do. So I would, I would say just use that as a, as a guideline, as a map. And if your coach is out there too, that's always the guideline. It's like, here's the map. They're telling me how to do it. I'm going to do this. <laughs> don't, don't try to reinvent, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. I did have one, we had one question come in on, um, the going up the bikini ladder, which is kind of cool. So this case, some of you don't know, this is an easy question to, to answer real quick. But um, how do you go? Uh, can I please explain going up the bikini competition sport ladder? So if any of you are really, really new, and sorry for some of you who've already know this, but basically you start off at a NPC local show. Um, it could be a you know, local show and you qualify for going to nationals in the open division. So when you do well in the open division, that's going to qualify you for nationals. Um, when you go to nationals, you then need to win either first place or first and second. If you go to uh, USA's is first and second place and nationals in Florida is also um, first and second place for bikini. And if you win first and second place in those two shows, you move on to the pro level. There's also, you know, junior nationals, universe, all these different shows. And um, you have to win first place in most of the other national shows. If you go to something like uh, the Arnold or the Olympia amateur, there's going to be differences on those. You either win it in, you have to win the overall and only the overall wins, or sometimes it's the overall and the top three in different countries will win a pro card. It's just so it's different for every, every one. So there's a lot of options for getting pro cards. There used to be no options at all for getting pro cards in like Europe and stuff. It was like you had to submit for it, but now they have a system. It's, it's great. Win and you're in. And then you go to pro shows. Uh, when you win a pro show, then you get to the Olympia. You win the Olympia and you are Miss Olympia. Wow. Ashley's done it three times. Yeah. It's so easy. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Just, just, just get to this. It's funny. <laughs> me, me and Sam are like, oh, you just gotta, just gotta win an Olympia. That's all. <laughs> just gotta... I think you think it's a lot easier than it is. No, though. absolutely. I don't not. know. You throw away. Oh yeah. She could be Miss Olympia so much. I'm like, who, <laughs> how many of us are going to win the Olympia that's this true. year? I just, 50 of us. That's true. I give it. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, it's like winning the lottery. It is winning the lottery because you need the right, you need the right setup. You need the right, the right judges to like you. You need the right structure. You need the right peak. You need everything. The right to like day. Perfect. It's got to yeah, be right, a day. Perfect day. Yeah. Even sometimes the right, the right competition against you. Yeah. Like they can, if you have, if three of the girls doing really good that year are really, really muscular, like crazy jacked girls, then you better fit pretty close to that True. you're not going to be you're probably not gonna be winning in that scenario if you're the softest smallest girl or something right so it's like True. the everything does need to line up really really well with it and that's in bikini you better be you better be tough mm -hmm. because um you're gonna have you're gonna have swings um like a good example is, is this weekend um there was there was a win of last last the, the weekend before the girl got eighth this weekend she won first you know kimber third place this week eighth place next right so it is, it is, you're going to have swings in bikinis. So you're going to have to be tough, but it could be your, and it could be anyone's day, which is really cool. True. I do true. love that part of it. You were talking about that earlier. It could be anyone's day at any time in bikini. And it's just part of the game, guys. It's Absolutely. part of the game. Yeah. So I'm going to answer this question. She asked twice. So we got to answer this one. It's from Dela. I have multiple scars on my stomach due to C-sections and other surgeries. Does that matter to the judges? I can't give you a hundred percent answer because I don't see your stomach, but I will say, as long as it's not like messing up your musculature, I guess, your lines, it shouldn't be an issue. I think you probably see them to be a lot more noticeable than maybe the judges. And especially after the tan, that can often hide a little bit of the scars. Uh, but yeah, it really shouldn't affect as long as it's not really affecting any of your actual muscles and your lines. Uh, same thing with tattoos. People can have tattoos too, as long as it doesn't like affect the muscle or how the muscle looks, then it should be fine. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it more likely than not, it's probably, 
um, probably just something that you notice that maybe the other judges don't see as much. Yeah, it's it really has to be a distracting part of it, right? right. It has to be. So like even with tattoos, even I've seen people with full sleeve tattoos where it had no impact on them whatsoever. And I've seen people with full sleeve tattoos where you couldn't see the muscle because everything was too dark. And so then there's a diff there's a difference of if it impacts anything or not. So the scars, same thing. Um, and just so you guys know, like most of the bikini competitors out there, even the high level pros have something stretch mark, scar, whatever, like most people have something, you know, so it's, uh, it's I have face tats. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. I have zero. <laughs> I cover it up with makeup every day. Yeah. So, so it's, 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 it's not something the judges are like looking to mark you down. I think a lot of times people think, oh, they're, they're marking down points. Like right. people always say mark down points. There's no, there's no such thing as marking down points. That's not a, that's not a thing. Marking down points. It's not like you start with a hundred and then one of these judges sees you and like, oh, there's a scar there. That's 99 points. And oh, her, it's got a, whatever a stretch mark. That's 98 points. And there's, it doesn't work that way. The judges, the way they judge it is they say, okay, that's first place, second place, third place. And that's your points. Okay. So first place is one point. Third place is three points. It's really that simple. 10 point, 10 places, 10 points. You add up all the points, the lowest score, just like in golf wins. Uh, if there's, if there's five judges, you'll throw out two of the scores. So that way, if I'm, if, if for example, if, if I'm judging Ashley or Kimber, I'm like, oh, they're in first place, no matter what, right? My score wouldn't count because they're going to get rid of the high and they're going to get rid of the low. Let's say me and Ashley were in a fight and I'm like, oh, I'm going to give her 10 plates. Ashley's been a little bit cranky lately. So they're going to say, well, that's another, that's a bias score. We're going to throw that score out. So you throw out the high, you throw out the low, and then the averages of those the three, that's going to be the placing, but there is no point deduction system. It's not a, you know, it just doesn't work that way. So they're not looking to mark you down. It's just, you know, and then if you get these big shows, you could have 13 judges at these huge shows and they're throwing out a lot of the scores. I think they're throwing out at those 13 ones, I think they're throwing out like five scores or something. Um, and then you're going to do an average of, it's like an odd number. I think the average ends up being like seven at those big shows. It's like an odd number. They want it to be an odd number, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so it's very, very fair. It's a very fair way of judging and don't have to worry too much about it. And I would also say if they do, if you do kind of get penalized for it, it's not because the judges think it's ugly or they hate scars or it's like a blemish. It's not like that. It's just, they genuinely can't, see the muscle if it's covered, you know what I mean? So likely if it's like between you yeah. and a girl and it's so, so, so close, you guys are tied so close and one person in, in one person has scars that covers their ab lines, you know, it's kind of like, well, what do you do? You can't judge it if it, you can't see it. So, you know, just know that it's nothing like, it's not like a preference or anything. It's just, we can't see it. Yeah. Oh, this is a good question because you got a tall wife that competes. I do. So, so this is a question perfect for Adam. <laughs> what role, this is from Izzy Linofit, uh, what role does height play in bikini? How does it affect someone's structure and shape? Okay, so kind of two questions there. The, the role of height, it doesn't really have that big of an impact on things at all. Um, it, what, your second question kind of answers the first. It really does come down to the structure and shape. You could be four foot 10 and have perfect balance between that four foot 10 inches, or you could be six feet tall and have perfect balance between that, those, those, you know, that six feet of inches. And if everything is balanced and perfect, then there really shouldn't be that big of a deal. Now, if you're taller, it's a lot more muscle to fill out generally to, to be rounder and fuller. Cause you still have to look the same. And you got to remember, it's not that, um, you know, five, five is the absolute perfect the perfect uh, size for a bikini. It's just, that's the most common. So you're going to get the most of girls on the stage or that. And so, because that's the most, it kind of becomes, okay, this is the, the amount of muscle they have. And this is kind of the amount of muscle we want those taller and shorter classes to have to balance out of what's, of what's the, the common girl is. Right. So it's not really, um, that big of a factor, but I will say, um, the taller girls, there's, you got to have your legs filled out more and it seems to be a little bit more difficult on the, the, the taller leg to fill them out a little bit more. That seems to be the common thing with tall bodybuilders, tall classic physique guys. Like it's just a little bit more to fill out. It's just more muscle to fill out muscle per square inch. So you have to just really, that's the only difference as long as the balance of the shape is there. Now, if you have someone who's tall and their torso is twice as long as their legs, then yeah, sorry, there, it, that's not good for any height. You know, it doesn't matter if it's, if you're four foot nine. It is not good for any height. So, um, you know, balance is, is always going to be key. So if you're balanced, shouldn't be that big of a factor. 
Very well said. Yeah. On yeah. to the next. Yeah. Okay. So these are all, all the done with those ones now. No, we got one left because I remember we have one left. Oh, really? Well, I'll scroll through then. Well, I'm going to say it if it hasn't shown up, it might be um, lost in there somewhere. Yeah, probably. But someone asked, besides the Arnold and the Olympia, what are my three favorite shows? And oh, I love this question. question. How do we that's that? a great question. And I, without a second thought, I, it, I already know the top three that come to my mind. Can you tell me? I already said the question. So <laughs> can, can you guess? I'm going to say, well, for sure, the mile well, high. That's one of them. I think... I think you like Wasatch. I like Wasatch. Do you? No. I like gonna... Wasatch, but top three, Adam? I mean, I'm saying outside of the Arnold and Olympia. I mean, I'm not competing in there this year. Yeah, that's <laughs> I true. mean, so, but... um, okay. What other shows do you really love? This is too easy. Well, I know for sure. The one I can know for sure is Mile High. You, what shows do you also do? I didn't. Oh, what about, okay, I'm going to throw out is. No. That's it. That's a, I wonder if so, there's I'm thinking of the stress. I bet I, you our viewers are already like, Adam, you're an well, idiot. Come I'm on. Thinking, I was thinking, I was like, well, Pittsburgh and New York are good shows, but those are, those are also I didn't even hard do New stress. York last week. Those here. are stress. Those are high level. So if, they have if more New York was too. my favorite show, wouldn't One I have done them. it yes, year, last year? Yeah. I don't know the other two, Ashley. I, I know. Oh my God. This do. is too easy. Can Japan you, Pro. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I haven't already you been, that show. I haven't been like praising that show for the past since November. That was a cool show. And then Vancouver. Oh, Vancouver. Duh, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have guessed Vancouver. So um, or I wouldn't have guessed Japan, but Vancouver, I should have known. Okay. Japan, we haven't been there enough I to make that, that like favorite show. I just didn't so think because he times. wasn't I'm thinking of repetitiveness, like shows you do every year. Favorite show. Okay. So listen. <laughs> Here I have the reasons why these are my three favorite. For the memories, mile high. That was my comeback show. That was our first show prepping together. It has so many memories. Team Elite Physique used to be based in Denver, Colorado. So every so ever since the Mile High started back in 2018, right? Ever since 2018, I've competed there every year, except for one year they didn't have it because of COVID. But all the years that it was available, I competed there. So Mile High, shout out, Jeff Taylor, you do a good job. Yeah. Love the Mile High. All right. Number two, Japan Pro Show. For the experience, for the atmosphere, for the environment, going somewhere new, somewhere that's so different from here, it's an experience, right? And as I've mentioned, they do it big with the production. I felt like I won the Olympia when I won Japan Pro. That's what I felt like because I felt like such a superstar. They really took care of the athletes. It seemed like such a big deal. The stage was the coolest stage I've ever been on, ever. That stage was crazy. Ever. Yeah. In it's so hard now to compete here at like a local show. And I'm like, ah, oh, Japan, man, the stage. <laughs> but yeah, so the experience for Japan Pro. And then lastly, Vancouver Pro for the people. The people. I love the Canadians and the Canadians love us. The Canadians love us. I love the Canadians. They're the nicest people. This Why are you guys is, so nice to us? Why are you guys like Canadians us so much? Just, just Americans aren't as nice as Canadians. I don't know. But the, and so we go there. There's like, I, I just feel the nice love people. in Vancouver. Yeah. I feel the love in Vancouver. So Vancouver Pro, Japan Pro, Mile High. And then honorable mention, Sasquatch Pro for the I was going to say that was my next. Trophy, yeah. For the trophy. So Adam, you did a horrible job. <laughs> I got one, got I one out of three. three. I should have. I would have never guessed Japan, but I. Yeah, how would you not guess Japan? Because we've only been to it. Was the time Twice? we the time we went to it was that also the yeah. same Japan show? Okay, because yeah. it was just different. It looked a lot different. So I was but like, I don't need to compete there frequently. Yeah, it's a new I was thing. Going I based on frequency, and you compete a lot. So I was like, what shows have we done? like three times or more that's what i was kind of mm. thinking but vancouver yeah so that's why i didn't get i'm so disappointed this is the <laughs> japan pro title too this is how cool is that that is cool it's like it's like a championship belt looks like she won the wwe wrestlemania here i got that and so much more they yeah. treat the athletes so well this japan pro cool, shout out such a cool belt too very cool so those are my top three with an honorable mention of four do you have any favorites um i will say mile high. i'll go up yeah mile high because it's I miss, I do miss, go, I miss Denver a lot. We had a really cool thing out there. Um, I miss it a lot. You know, it's a, Denver's just a cool fitness spot. It really has got a, got a special place in my heart for sure. Armbrust Pro Gym, Dylan out there, just a lot of friends, a lot of old coaches that I've just grew up with. And like, it's funny, like the, 
the environment now versus the environment then it's just so different for the coaches because when we were younger um you know and we're on our 20s in coaching in denver like all of us were like real feisty you know we were like oh i want to beat you and it wasn't friendly it was like real Mm -hmm. feisty it wasn't like oh you're my my bro and you also have skill and we'll just see whoever wins cool you know it was like i'm gonna beat you and, and i like it was just an attitude it was like a feisty it was a different time you know and like we're all old now so we're like laughing about how we used to be so just the energy just growing up there and then just seeing everyone kind of grow and um the athletes become coaches and the coaches get athletes to the olympia and it's like it's just a nice it's just fun because it used to be people forget it wasn't really online before it was all local you know so it's just a different, a different thing. So I love that show, especially. And Jeff Taylor always does a great job. Um, you know, I don't even know how long I've done that guy now, but um, that one I will say too, experience-wise, um, Korea and Japan were still like some of my is my favorite experiences. I definitely want to go back, maybe Japan then this year. I'm trying to get yeah. you back there, Adam. I'm down. I'm down to go. I'm trying to get you. No, you, you well, gotta break your. Oh, I can't Sunday. I gotta be back Sunday. Okay, I, it's. So hey, I have, a, I, have a, I have a rule. I have a rule. And even Kimber did it this weekend. So I don't like Sunday shows because like Mondays are always our busiest day. And it's really hard for me to travel on a Monday back. That's the only thing that kills me. But these over these international shows, I do miss experiences. And I will say honorable mention, Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes. Okay. Honorable mention for another location. Yeah. Paradise. Okay. And so, everyone's nice. I kind of want to go back there like every year. Yeah. Um, I went to the 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 gym there too. Um, they treated me really well. We did a posing seminar. Well, I'll, if we go there again, I'm going to do another posing seminar uh, at that gym as well. I forget, is it TY? Was it TYJ? I have to look it up. We did a posing seminar earlier. Um, they're awesome gym. It was like a, it wasn't an outdoor gym. It was an indoor gym, but it had garages on both sides. So it was like an outdoor, and it's Hawaii. Dude, the temperature is awesome, you know? And I'll say the people in Hawaii, like the people in Hawaii make me want to live in Hawaii. Like that's like one of the places I'm like, I could see myself retiring here. Like it's a little slower for what I'm used to in Vegas, you know, but the people were so it was like, like Vancouver, but like more like family, like there. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys was like, what do you need? I got you. I'll take you anywhere. So that, like, they're like setting things up for me. Um, they said they'd bring me food. I'm like, I'm cool. I'm not a competitor. You know, I don't need to eat. Like I'll bring you food or whatever. And I'm like, it's, it's so, it was so over the top. Nice. It was like, it was so over the top. Nice. And I was like, how come everyone in Hawaii is so like, like so nice like this? He's like, He's like, and he was like explaining his Hawaiian like tradition. He's like, it's because when you come to Hawaii, it's like we we think of you as a guest, like you're coming to our house, and we want to treat you like you're coming to our house. And it's like that's the that's the Hawaiian culture. And I'm like, man, this is just like love out there. Like it's mm-hmm. just, which is crazy because all the all the boxers I run into that are from Hawaii, they're all really nice to me, like outside, of the, but they're all killers in the ring. So you just don't think you think of this like tough culture where they're not going to be that nice because these guys are just monsters in the in the ring. And so I'm like, I was kind of expecting more of a chip on your shoulder attitude, but not at all. It was not at all. So anyway, that would be mine. But yeah, I mean, I do want to go back to Hawaii. I, really I like get that. to go back to Hawaii in uh, August. Oh, yeah. So I'll give you guys information on that coming soon, but I'm doing a seminar there in nice. Hawaii. Yeah. Nice. So. But Hawaii mm-hmm. Pro, maybe this year we'll, 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 maybe we'll see if we can, if you line up with that and that lines up or not too. That, that show is cool. I'm going to. I have to go to that show again. It's just a fun, just a fun place to be. And it's like a free vacation too. Yeah. I can ride it off. You know, exactly. any, any trip travel I can ride off. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, I can ride off a couple of those days at least. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so what about you guys? Any favorite shows we're missing? So, you know, throw it in the comments here. But yeah, I'm just trying to think any other fun experience. Vancouver's Coast, we had that West Coast. All of them West are Coast, fun, Iron. honestly. Yeah. They're all good experience. There's no bad experiences with the shows, but I do have some that I hate that I favor more than ever others. So you know. remember that one show we went to it was like in the middle of nowhere, but we had the most fun. Yeah, we were so stupid. We were yeah. That was my last. That was like our last big stupid. We were so I know. <laughs> you had that wig and oh you're just God. wearing it around town, Fabrizio. Fabrizio, that was so I can't even. And I made that video I that I post every single yeah. year for your birthday. So next month I gotta I got was, that that video ready to be posted like tradition yeah. as tradition goes every year on adam's birthday i post the fabrizio video it was that st- this when. video <laughs> will prevent adam ever from running for office if 100 100 um, actually nowadays they'd be like oh this guy's the one <laughs> <laughs> so i i'm really proud of that video honestly because i edited it myself so you guys gotta wait till may 13th hey, look at may you. 13th yeah i know i i'm terrible with dates i'm not gonna, i'm not gonna put the, the day or the year i'm sorry with the year. Oh, that's okay. But May 13th, 
that's Adam's birthday. And yep. you better believe a Fabrizio video will be dropping. And if it is May 13th, when you're listening to this, you better check my Instagram right now, Ashley K Fit, for this video. That was yeah. So even the even the shows that weren't the most fun, we had the most like yes. with the fun fun with Absolutely. like the, the area. That's actually where I got that banana shirt too. That same yeah. show. We went to the mall and I found this really cool banana shirt. And I've wore that shirt for like years because it's just such a fun Don't shirt. Don't get rid of it. I think I did. No, you didn't. I think I did. It's, it's got played out. Yeah. I try to, cause I, you know what it is? I try to buy new shirts for just for the podcast. Otherwise I'm just wearing a black shirt, but for the podcast, I'll like try to mix it up and buy a podcast t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I wore that one out. I want to wear it so many times, you know? Yes. So anyway, there you go. That well, was fun. That was fun. Oh my gosh. These Q and A's. Oh, we'll thank you guys for watching. We'll do another Q and A. Uh, we'll do another sometime, Q &A this year. Yeah. sometime. Yeah. yeah. Just stay tuned for it sometime. But in the meantime, Ask us some questions because sometimes questions become topics themselves. If it's an in-depth enough question, we can make a topic out of it. So topic suggestions, any other questions, leave them in the comment section. Thank you for watching, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Talk to you later. Bye.